Okay. Okay. So uh, I guess we should uh, think I'll just invite everyone right now and then we can start Let me admit all. Okay, so uh, it gives us uh, great pleasure to have Professor Maitrej Ghatak uh, giving us a talk today. Uh, why do people stay poor? Uh, he, you know, all of us know him, but uh, you know, just he's a professor of economics at London School of Economics, and uh, he's been to the ISI a few times. Uh, probably we want him more here. Uh, so he's going to speak on uh, for an hour. Uh, the questions are, we, we request that the questions be just purely clarificatory if you really have to ask it. Otherwise, there is some time in the end uh, for discussion. So, Mr. Katak, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Abhiru. Uh, so, uh, can, can, can the slides be seen? Yeah, they can. Okay, Thank good. You. So thanks for uh, inviting uh, me to present on this uh, uh, particular series, which unfortunately this was one of those perfect storms. I was a uh, visit to the Delhi ISI was long overdue and Obiru has been uh, persistent in, in, in uh, kind of chasing me to fix dates, which we had finally done uh, with a charming coincidence of end of March uh, of this year. So I was all set to visit and give this paper in person. We know what happened afterwards. So yeah, there was some uh, scrambling, whatever. And I do hope to uh, be back uh, in Delhi and in Delhi ISI physically. Uh, not, not clear when that will be possible again. But anyway, it's good to see uh, at least some familiar faces, um, uh, uh, albeit virtually. So what this paper really tries to do it started with a conversation i uh, was having with my colleagues robin burgess and oriana bandera who had done this um, asset transfer program um, uh, in in bangladesh with brac where rural women were basically given livestock related assets um, mainly cows and this was an rct across villages and they studied them over a long uh, um, kind of panel uh, by the standard of these studies. And I'll come to the details later. So in a way, uh, the conversation was I, was, I have always been interested in models of poverty traps coming more from the development theory side of things, whether it's in occupational choice models with kind of general equilibrium effects or with more partial equilibrium models with indivisibilities and market frictions, et cetera. And it just seemed like this was an interesting setting to test uh, if poverty trap, uh, the kind of mechanisms that underlie them have any, any basis um, in, in, in empirical basis. So that was really the motivation of the paper. And you know, to uh, develop an economics crowd, uh, this very classic question does not in some ways uh, really require a lot of elaboration, namely, if you observe somebody to be poor, is it because this person is there uh, because of some kind of a combination of indivisibilities and other types of frictions, and some push will help this person get into a virtuous path of accumulation and get to a better point? Or is it really what it is, namely, it's a reflection of fundamentals, you know, and therefore uh, it is some kind of a steady state uh, and any hope would have to lie in changing uh, the uh, underlying parameters uh, and, you know, that, that would be uh, the alternative view of things. Now, even if there is persistence, you would well ask, you know, what are the mechanisms behind it? And there's a very rich literature on, on poverty traps, you know, uh, some of the early formal, well, not necessarily algebraic, but economically formal discussions go back to Malthus, but, you know, informal references to vicious cycle of poverty are, are, are plenty. And of course, over the last three, four decades, there's been a lot of formal work on this as well in terms of, um, you know, uh, uh, writing down models of dynamic asset accumulation, sometimes with 
um, then uh, aggregation across different agents and looking at individual poverty traps, aggregate poverty traps, et cetera. Uh, so one of the reasons, in fact, given that I have limited time, I'll be happy to share the slides with you, um, um, you know, so, but uh, given that I have, uh, it's about an hour, I will skip some of the more chatty slides, okay? So because I want to come kind of straight and uh, uh, to the main point of the uh, paper and, and, and have a, a discussion around that rather than give a very leisurely introduction. So the, for example, I'm just skipping some of the literature and some of the, you know, why should we broadly care about poverty traps other than uh, this kind of conceptual question that if we see somebody uh, to be poor, whether it's a reflection of fundamentals versus whether it's a reflection of historical accidents and some um, pushes could get this person out of it. And at any point, if there is a, if there's a question, I, I you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm kind of um, happy to pause and, and, and uh, answer clarifying questions. If any, if the terminology or notation or whatever I'm saying is not clear. So this is a kind of graphical description of what I have in mind, okay? So this is a very well-known figure. We have, you know, uh, asset accumulation, KT on the horizontal axis, KT plus one on the vertical axis, okay? And this is kind of a regular production function. And suppose we observe somebody at H and somebody at L, these are the two points. Now, is it the case that these are basically individuals with two different types of transition equations, and these are two stable steady states, and they just reflect the fact that one person in this case has higher productivity, AH, and the other person has lower productivity? Of course, productivity is just one aspect. People may have preferences, more forward-looking, et cetera, but I'm keeping it simple. Alternatively, could it be that the transition equation looks like uh, this particular S-shaped curve that I have uh, drawn here? And again, what you get to observe is, you know, some folks who are at H, uh, clustered around H, some folks who are clustered on L. And if that is the case, then in fact, if you push some of the people in L uh, just a bit above K hat, then uh, those guys will uh, have a cumulative uh, uh, momentum towards uh, going to H. Of course, if it's below K hat, then they will uh, revert um, uh, to their original uh, position. Now, of course, uh, you know, poverty trap idea has been around. I mean, and it's interesting that it, it has echoes in, in macro. I mean, even it solos 56 famous paper. If you look at one of the footnotes, uh, you will see that he talks about income effects and savings behavior, and that could lead to multiple steady states, et cetera. So that, that was a you know, while, while back, and you know, some of, clearly that idea was very much there. In the 60s, there are optimal growth theory was in fashion, and there are, you know, uh, again, a number of papers, Ozawa and several others, who talk about income effects and why you, know, you could have multiple steady states, et cetera. Then I would say in the 80s and 90s, there's this whole uh, literature, you know, in the more micro side, uh, Das Gupta Rai. Uh, on the more macro side, there's Banerjee Newman, Galur Zaira, uh, et cetera, that are kind of talking about a um, uh, possibility of this multiple steady states, et cetera, which is how we economists interpret poverty traps. Now, why haven't people tested for it? Well, the reason is it is difficult. The problem with observational data is accumulation of capital is endogenous to individual characteristics and circumstances. And therefore we cannot just simply uh, compare say two groups of people, one say bunched around H or some higher asset level, some bunched around L and somehow claim that this twin peaks type of thing is evidence for poverty traps itself because we, you know, the unobserved uh, characteristics would play, play a big role. And moreover, the other reason why we don't get to test for poverty, uh, easy test for poverty traps are not available, is essentially the underlying uh, concept of a poverty trap, whether it's at the individual level or at the economy level, is if there is a big enough shock, then the final outcome could be very, very different. But things are locally stable. So that kind of means that what you would need is some kind of a big shock to see, you know, that would be not the only way, but one way to test some of this. And indeed, uh, some of you will know that 
there are some aggregate approaches to using massive uh, historical shocks to test whether there has been poverty traps. For example, Donald Davids and Weinstein have this idea from war. If there is a big enough shock at the economy-wide level, does the economy then kind of reconstruct and rebuild around the old steady state or something you know, shifts, et cetera? So here, I think our uh, real opportunity is that this was a big enough asset transfer program that BRAC was doing in Bangladesh, okay? And at the village level, this was uh, done at a randomized uh, uh, level. And third, uh, we have uh, the, you know, I, I can take very little credit in the data collection process because I came into the project later, but uh, I'm saying we in the sense of the collective uh, group of people involved, you know, there is a panel that goes, uh, uh, you know, uh, and not just the ultra poor, which was 6,000 households uh, that, that, uh, that uh, eventually got the asset. Initially, it was the control treatment, 3,000 each, roughly speaking, and eventually, of course, all of them got it. But they also tracked in these villages a subsample of some of the other wealth classes. So this is actually an impressive uh, panel that uh, my co-authors and their colleagues have, have built up. So what we are basically trying to see is if we can take uh, N people at K, K bar L, which is the low steady state in terms of this hypothetical uh, poverty trap kind of uh, possibility that I have shown here and, and throw some of them, assign some random capital transfers and then try to see that those who you know, uh, exceed a certain level are they accumulating up to the K upper bar H or falling below K bar L, et cetera. Now here too, as some of you are already, I'm sure thinking, one challenge will be individual level heterogeneity because while the randomization was done at the village level, which is in a way clean and the shock is big, that is also advantageous. We would have to worry whether those who were clustered around say K bar L, some of which will be a bit below, some of will be a bit above, right? And suppose we find that, you know, after this extra asset they received, those who had a slightly higher uh, level of capital and the low steady state, they are essentially reaching a much higher steady state. We would have to also address the concern that is it because that these guys were already productive uh, and therefore have some other characteristics that, that could be correlated with their initial capital stock. And these are some of the things that will be at the center of what I plan to present um, in, in, you know, over, the, uh, over the next, uh, actually I should have, a, um, I keep an eye on the watch. So I, I, I have about 45 minutes, right? A, a bit more. Obiru? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. In fact, yeah. So, um, uh, can I ask one quick, quick question? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Please do. I mean, do concerns like risk aversion of the individuals? I mean, will they have any role in your discussion down the line? No. I mean, we have a particular data set, and we are carrying out a particular test. There are really a whole uh, set of issues we could explore here, whether it's risk aversion, whether it's transactions costs of various kinds. So our approach will be relatively parsimonious. So yes, I mean, risk aversion, you know, we, I'm aware of uh, risk of, uh, models of uh, poverty traps that are based on risk aversion, you know, uh, technology choice, et cetera. But this is a very particular setting, right? And we will be carrying out a particular test and that's all we do, right? So uh, of the, I think, countable infinite number of ways in which one could approach, you know, poverty traps in general, uh, ours will be a particular path driven by the particular survey that we have informed by a particular uh, class of theoretical models. Okay? Okay. Right. So let me just outline a little bit uh, the, you know, there is, in the paper has a uh, theoretical uh, discussion. Here I'm just going to use largely a diagrammatic uh, tool to uh, explain or exposit what expect in a kind of soul like setting versus a more uh, poverty trap like setting if suddenly uh, uh, people are given a certain extra injection of capital 
okay? And the beauty of this at some level is that the amount of the capital that's given, that's a constant that doesn't vary across people, right? So it's the same, you know, it's, it's basically the modal uh, asset that was transferred was a cow. Uh, and, and, and that is uh, advantageous as opposed to if this uh, size is varied in terms of who was getting it, etc. So this should be a very well-known picture from all of us from, you know, kind of very, very first approach to growth models, etc. Okay, so I will not kind of waste time by going through the uh, details of it. But again, if, if something is not clear, uh, do, do stop me because it's, uh, I have added some bells and whistles to what is otherwise a standard diagram. What I would like to really take uh, for you to look at, and again, I'm, I'm sure that your intuition uh, will um, tell you that this is what you would expect, that, hey, so you have a bunch of people, and this is the standard uh, solo-like uh, framework where with the constant saving rates and a transition equation that is uh, represented in the slide. So basically, you could be anywhere on the horizontal axis, that's your initial K0, and suppose you're given this delta, yeah? So what this implies is, of course, if you had already more than the steady state level, then you were on the path of decumulation anyway, and having an extra capital injection would cause you to decumulate faster. In contrast, if you were already short of the steady state, which is what we would expect among the very poor, then of course you would uh, accumulate, but the rate at which you accumulate would be determined by how close you were to the steady state. So this is kind of the mean reversion type of logic to it. And indeed, if you hear what I've done is taken that uh, diagram, but I have plotted in the following way that now I have K0 on the horizontal axis like before, but now all I have is the extra capital that is accumulated in the period after delta was given. So here, delta is what is initially given. Then by the standard logic of this diagram, you know, you now have some K0 plus delta. Then through the transition equation, you figure out what is going to be the extra capital accumulated in the next period, et cetera, right? So that is what I'm referring to delta one. And essentially, this faithfully replicates what happens in the earlier diagram. Okay, that you can see that except for a very low level of initial capital where there could be an increasing uh, segment, in general, you would expect kind of a mean reversion type of thing, that the higher is your existing capital stock, the less is likely to be your increment after you've received an initial big shock. Everything is the same, except for now the transition equation displays a kind of, you know, S-shaped thing, and once again, uh, those of you, uh, you know, you're familiar with these uh, uh, kind of models, you will know that this S shape is just really taken for, um, you know, I think very likely for its geometric elegance, no, 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 and you could have many other forms of non-convexities that would uh, kind of deliver the thing. So the key thing is that you have multiple steady states, namely this transition equation intersects the 45 degree line in at least three points, and the middle one will be the unstable one but that, that's that's how it's going to be right now it's interesting because even in this diagram you can see that i don't know if you can you see my uh, the hand in the adobe uh, thing is that visible yes 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 yeah i have to figure out a way to use a pointer in in this uh, you know zoom uh, uh, business that we we have to now uh, kind of master but anyway so if you look at the hand here so if the world started here, if this was the uh, origin, then we have basically the solo picture like in the previous slide, right? And then whatever I said there would apply here. So the fun bit happens in the you know, bit that is below, right? And that's where you can see that uh, if you have very low levels of initial capital, then giving you the same delta is not good enough for you. You are going to actually decumulate because, you know, it's like you have nothing, no complementary assets to make productive use of the cow, like a cow shed, like uh, maybe a rickshaw van to carry your uh, milk to the local uh, town or the larger village, which are, these are all empirical and informed examples given the setting that uh, we, we, we are studying, okay? And therefore we have a picture like this. Okay, so uh, this is again a stylized picture, but it kind of reflects what was in the earlier theoretical diagram. Namely, you're given this initial capital transfer of delta, and then what is delta one? 
and how that how does that depend on uh, k0 in particular this part of the diagram is very similar to the solo part right so that that story very much holds but this earlier part now is very very interesting and it only you know as you would expect that if you were exactly lucky enough to have k hat minus delta then getting delta would mean you're exactly you know you will be uh, crossing the threshold and then you would be accumulating a positive amount etc yeah but otherwise you will fall below and you will decumulate okay so what i'm going to do is i um, uh, there is a so this is kind of my theoretical or conceptual preliminaries. Now my entire challenge for the next um, uh, half an hour or so uh, would be to essentially map uh, the particular empirical setting that uh, my co-authors and their colleagues have, have studied in depth and try to extract some kind of a test that would uh, allow us to link uh, this theoretical framework to this particular, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, data that we have, and uh, and how how to uh, ascertain whether something like a poverty trap could be going on here. So there are a number of things we do, and I will not even. Uh, I mean, the paper I think with appendices everything is uh, was already sixty pages long, and now we are revising it. Um, so it has actually undergone some changes, even with respect to the slides. Uh, so now it stands at 80 pages, I think. So, um, you know, uh, so therefore I will not, especially the structural model of occupational choice that we estimate, I'm not even going to get get to that. Okay, I'm just going to stick to the main kind of test that we have as to whether there is evidence for poverty traps and some of the identification questions surrounding it. Uh, that will be my focus. There's also a very non-trivial policy discussion that, okay, this is great in rural Bangladesh and you know, wonderful that it, it sort of whatever we see is what happens, but is this therefore a general policy we would advocate everywhere? And in particular, you know, what happens to then microfinance? What happens to other things? I'm very happy to come back to those things because that's a non-trivial and perhaps the most, uh, you know, from a more uh, general point of view, the more policy relevant discussion. But here I will, uh, uh, you know, largely be somewhat narrow and focused on the core uh, test for this uh, underlying um, mechanism that we are trying to identify. So if I do not discuss that much the policy implications, it's not because I don't think it's important. It is actually super important. and. Uh, one could well have a very, very interesting discussion about what is it really telling us about what should be done. But uh, given the time limitations, I'm happy to maybe get to that more in the Q&A or, um, uh, 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 yeah, so after I'm done with the main part. Okay. So uh, what I, again, uh, my, uh, my apologies uh, the, in terms of that, I had some really wonderful slides uh, in terms of the basic descriptives of the survey, because frankly, I, I you know, when uh, there are a couple of uh, papers that I have been teaching, you know, and uh, Robin and Oriana's paper was one of them, and as well as some, you know, which in, are, are very uh, core to some of the theoretical ideas that some of us have been working on for a while. So there is a lot of richness here. And I, you know, and in some ways with a more leisurely uh, talk, I would go walk you through some of the descriptives as to how that uh, then uh, suggests certain patterns. But today I'll have to do a little bit of a, you know, slash and move on kind of thing. But once again, do stop me if, if there's a big jump in terms of why am I moving from one place to the other. Okay, and I'm always happy to come back and show you some of the descriptives a bit more uh, if, if that is relevant to any question you have. So basically, this is some broad outline. There's about 21,000 households of which 6,000 are the ultra poor. They're called, uh, it is a called uh, um, um, the TUP, targeting the ultra poor. So TUP is, is what the program is called. And uh, 21K households, 6K extremely poor, living in about 1300 villages in the 13 poorest districts in the northern part of uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, which are often frequently subject to drought and, 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 and kind of generally poor. And basically these are women who are constrained to be in the villages. They're either single or they have uh, spouses working in the city. Some are seasonal migrants, etc. Okay. 
Now, basically, uh, they were offered some choice about several asset packages, uh, all of which were roughly valued at about 500, 560 US dollar uh, in PPP, uh, about 10K Bangladeshi Taka in 2007. And essentially what it did was move about 3000 women from the low mode to the lowest density point in the asset distribution, which I'll show you in a bit. And 90% plus of eligible women chose an asset bundle containing a cow. And the BRAC essentially, and this is an interesting feature that we will use in our identification. Uh, essentially, uh, encourages might be a slightly Orwellian term here. Uh, that basically BRAC requires respondents not to sell off the asset uh, in the very first uh, period, which is for the, for the two years, after which they have the freedom to liquidate it. Because whatever accumulation decision we show, it has to be out of voluntary choice of these participants. And therefore, the first two years, because they were required by the program not to sell off the asset and require, you know, receive the mandatory training with the, you know, uh, basically it's dairy business, right? Uh, and, and all of that. So essentially, the way this is done, and this is where I would prefer to skip a bit because it's in, in some ways all in the um, uh, QJ 2017 paper uh, that uh, 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 Oriana Robin uh, published with uh, some of their um, earlier co-authors, uh, where basically they present the average treatment effect of this program, okay? And um, I mean, I, if I have to give you a one line summary, that is the average treatment effect of this program was uh, significant in terms of pushing women who were basically doing wage labor or domestic labor, you know, uh, uh, agricultural wage labor or domestic labor uh, into uh, self-employment, which is the dairy farming. And indeed, their savings are quadrupled, uh, even though the initial levels were pretty low, but still these are significant uh, effects. Their income consumption level, all of that kind of went up. That was roughly the finding of the earlier, earlier study, okay, the average treatment effect. Here we, of course, have in mind the dynamics and the pattern of the accumulation path, which is our focus. And so uh, we will, um, focus, you know, I, I am just mentioning what the broad finding that was from the earlier study. So what is the general picture? I'm going to show you certain things, you know, essentially what you, uh, in fact, let me skip that. And these are the, the lot of nuanced things that I, I don't want to necessarily get into in the interest of time. So basically what you have is uh, four wealth classes which were ex ante determined by BRAC based on their various uh, socioeconomic surveys. And these people were classified into ultra poor, near poor, middle class, upper class. Of course, middle class, upper class is all contextual in the context of those villages. I mean, in the, even in terms of average uh, picture of Bangladesh, these are uh, uh, low income uh, categories, um, even if they might be uh, relatively uh, higher wealth in this village. So you can see some of these numbers here that you see that the ultra poor basically work more and their total income is less and their productive asset, that's where there's a huge difference uh, if you look at the last kind of um, thing that I marked. Uh, and, you know, that is where uh, the asset differences are kind of, you know, there's difference everywhere, but the asset differences are pretty, pretty large. And we can also see uh, that the if you look at in the horizontal axis, I have the you know various wealth classes and and this uh, histograms uh, with their different color uh, things have uh, how much of the relevant occupation they're doing. So basically, as you can see, that uh, the light uh, purple is the one that is livestock rearing, the um, medium purple is domestic made, and the dark purple is agricultural day laborer. And you can see kind of a monotonic relationship that the more wealth you have, you know, essentially you move more and more into livestock. Uh, Professor, just one yeah. clarification. What constitutes the others? Just in the... I, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Okay. I would say this is like, you know, uh, from my, what my co-authors tell me, these are uh, the smaller categories, but these are uh, other activities. For example, you could be, you know, uh, um, running some store, uh, you could be doing sewing, etc. Okay, but okay. yeah, I, I wasn't involved with the survey, so I'll only focus on the core categories that I 
uh, we are using for this paper. Uh, I, I doubt if it's in their QJE paper, but yeah, I mean, it's a fair question, but like every survey, I'm sure there's a residual category of yes. others. Where, yeah. Uh, just you, another Paul. clarificatory question. Uh, so the randomization wasn't within each one of these groups, right? So it was just cluster randomization. So within the ultra poor, near poor, middle and upper class, the experiment wasn't random. Right. No, 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 it wasn't. And it wasn't even in for, for our point of view, the, you know, uh, best randomization would have been if it was for the same wealth level, if you know, you, you exactly. exactly, the same, yes. exactly. Yes. yes, it's not, you know, even though this is a discontinuously, uh, you know, improvement and compared to other attempts at getting at this question, because of the village level randomization and the fact that it was the same size, and it was this group it is still far from the ideal data set you would want, if that's the premise of your question. Yes, that's what I was asking, thanks. Yeah, yeah, it's not an, uh, yeah, exactly. It is, as, uh, again, I, I don't uh, wish to sound self-congratulatory, but yes, I mean, compared to the general literature for testing poverty traps, the fact that we have a panel structure that the initial, uh, you know, uh, randomization, uh, sorry, the asset transfer was a bulky one, but the same for a certain group that already allows us to avoid some of the pitfalls that earlier studies have experienced, right? Uh, but having said that, uh, you're exactly right in saying that, yes, uh, ideally, uh, you would want it even uh, for, uh, you know, it's the classic thing is the twin. It's like the twin studies. You want two individuals who are kind of identical in every respect, including initial assets. And then you give one of them the delta, et cetera. But, but just, just another follow-up question. You uh, could do individual fixed effects analysis. Maybe you have done And that. we do, and we have, yeah, yeah. We do lots of things. And, and the revision we are undertaking is uh, doing even more lots of things. But yes, um, uh, we did think of that. Right. Okay. Indeed, going back to your question, in fact, one of the identification strategies I'll show will exactly get to some of those things because, because we have uh, these guys were required not to sell the asset for two years. We can actually measure the individual fixed effect in their self-employment activity, even if they sold it off later, right? So that's where the richness of the data does help us, okay? Was it a, what ensured that they don't sell the assets? I mean, was there a condition for further transfers? Look, again, I cannot answer that question except for uh, the compliance rate was high, whether Brax sort of said, you know, uh, it's like Don Corleone style in The Godfather that they made an offer that these guys couldn't refuse or whether this was persuasion, you know, with, with uh, you know, other, other more congenial means that I don't know. Okay. But there were checks as to whether the assets were in place after two years, et cetera. I think there were some isolated cases of death uh, of the animal or some severe distress in the family. But largely speaking, it was, uh, it was uh, enforced, uh, at least so the uh, survey is telling us. Okay, uh, any further questions while I go through the descriptive? So, uh, okay. So as we look at, uh, if you look at also uh, uh, this particular, uh, um, um, uh, you know, a diagram here, if you look at the total productive assets, uh, I don't know how, uh, uh, is it somebody, uh, uh, there's a little scratch on, on, on the diagram that was not intended, uh, but anyway. So you can see that in terms of the composition of assets that as you have higher and higher assets, you get to the, uh, you know, uh, higher value assets, you know? So if you're at the lower level, most of your asset is poultry, chicken, right? Then as you kind of uh, go, uh, go uh, up on the uh, total productive assets, yeah, you get a uh, higher value composition of assets, et cetera. So, uh, sorry. Yeah, I think. Um, now I want to, yeah, so want to show you the f uh, following. Uh, there was very limited evidence of mobility within this uh, folks that the probability, for example, that the ultra poor would the reach the median level of say the middle or upper class is actually relatively uh, low, almost negligible. 
This is an important one. Essentially, what we have here is the distribution of productive assets at baseline. Okay, so just to be clear, this is baseline. This is before the asset transfer. Okay, uh, what you have on the horizontal axis is the log productive assets, and uh, what you have on the vertical axis are percent, you know, uh, various um, uh, probability densities, you know, uh, percentages really. And the red one is the treatment and the dashed blue one is the control, okay? And you can see that they're largely uh, similar. And you can see a twin peak type of thing with some concentration around this point and some con concentration around very close to zero. Now, this is the first kind of bit that uh, uh, allows me to transition into uh, our paper, as opposed to some of the earlier things are coming from the study for which the average treatment effects were discussed in the QJ paper. So basically what we have is, uh, these are the densities for the uh, four years. So uh, the baseline is, is, is the one that you saw. Uh, and then you have the year two, that's the you know, green one. And that's when you had this asset transfer that happened. Uh, year four is where you have you know, two years after this uh, restriction period was lifted. Okay, so, so that is what we will be focusing on in a lot of our work. And then of course, year seven, et cetera. So- Just one uh, quick clarification, yeah, yeah. Professor. So you have just shown that the, uh, baseline you have by model graph but here we uh, the one you have just shown is not the baseline is not by model so so yeah so, so i'm really uh, could you please clear clarify the no i think it's the different scale issue because if you if you look uh, look at uh, I, I i think that you're right that at least on visual appearance the first mm -hmm. one this one is not looking exactly the same. So I will actually have to check as to, you know, why that is the case. But yes, if I look at here, uh, um, yeah, they're, they're not exactly comparable. Hmm. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll have to get back to you because okay. I think that this was, uh, because here the max is happening around just a bit above 1.5, right? Here yeah. the max yeah. is happening a bit uh, below two yeah. and you would have expected a bump around, uh, yeah between six and seven yes. and here you don't quite see the bump so no, I, I will have to thing. check with what is going no. on and, and there that's that's well spotted actually anyway, you, so, no no worries so what i'm going to do here is the following so uh sticking to um uh, the kind of core result that i want to show you so basically um uh, the program what it did is captured here so it is took a bunch of you know, mass in the, or density in the very lower tail of this distribution, yeah, and pushed it uh, roughly in this region. And which is kind of interesting because that's where, you know, in, in, you can see that the earlier uh, concentration was either here or there, right? And now you're pushing them around this and then you want to study the subsequent behavior, right? And this is again, if you do the before and after, yeah, I think you're quite right. I think this was there was some issue with that particular uh, graph, and we I, I think that this one is updated, but that one needs to be updated. So that's not exactly there was some programming issue when when I had uh, four the four of the densities uh, juxtaposed. Anyway. So uh, that's what it does. And indeed, if you see the before and after, this is, this is how it's kind of looking out, that there was the treatment and the control here. So that, that is being shown. And you can see a little bulge around just a bit, you know, between two and three, really. Okay. And this is our core kind of finding. So I'm, I'm skipping a bit, but let me come to the core, core issue. So now this I've seen. So first of all, you can see this is the kind of size of the transfer. The poor program moves the poorest into the lowest uh, kind of uh, density area. And if you look at the share of control households and change in log productive assets, you can see that if you uh, track the asset um, uh, that uh, accumulation that the control group was displaying, yeah, um, this kind of size is relatively rare because if you look at the size here, that is roughly in terms of the log points, about two, 2.2 log points. And here you can see that that is kind of relatively rare. So therefore this was a big shock, okay? 
And what we basically do is uh, the following. Uh, there are, let me uh, get to the, so basically uh, one set of, the, there are three sets of results that I'll present now. And that has goes to the heart of what's really going on with this asset transfer. How are the accumulation patterns looking like and how do they compare with the accumulation pattern or the transition equations of the control group, et cetera, et cetera. That's one, but two, takes head on the question that was hinted earlier on in a question uh, that since the randomization was at the village level or actually set of villages, it's a BRAC kind of uh, office uh, level, regional office level, a uh, couple of villages around uh, each office. Uh, how do we allow for the fact that your initial capital stock, because if you think about one neat, you know, just to do a thought experiment, suppose there's no heterogeneity in productive ability or preferences. Suppose people are indeed all identical, yeah? Then we have a very chance of a very neat test because essentially if you have a threshold effect that if you need a certain critical threshold of assets for you to reach a discreetly higher level of uh, steady state assets, then in some ways those with K hat you know, who just crossed that. So their initial capital was K zero, uh, you know, K hat minus K zero was less than Delta. Yeah, these guys will cross the K hat and they will kind of go up and the others will fall below and that would be our test, okay? Now, of course, as you might have guessed that a lot of our thinking, and that's why I was saying that the, we, we did a number of things, including individual fixed effects, et cetera. Um, uh, 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 our uh, worry has been to deal with the fact that how much of this stuff is being driven by heterogeneity among individuals that's um, not just at the level of the initial capital stock. So I want to show you the core finding here, okay? So uh, if you look at uh, the, the left uh, the picture is a theoretical one, but the right one, and I'll show a blown up version of that too, that in some ways is one of our very key diagrams and, 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 and figures and that I want uh, us to uh, keep on coming back or uh, this some, some sense is one of our prime exhibits. So this is on the horizontal axis, we have baseline productive assets post-transfer. This is all in log scale, okay? And of course, because it's post-transfer, these are all treatment people, these are not anybody else, okay? This is the treated ultra poor. On the horizontal axis, we have the baseline uh, productive assets in, in log units. And then what we have on the vertical axis is productive assets in 2011, okay? So this you could think about is the KT on the horizontal axis and KT plus one with the, you know, since 2009 up till then, they were not really uh, allowed to sell off their assets, okay? you can see that the transition equation does have a feature. If this is a non-parametric estimation, we fitted uh, also a cubic polynomial uh, for a more parametric estimation of this. So this is kind of our uh, key key finding, okay? So one of our key, key exhibits, okay? That yeah, those who were above, uh, somehow magically reach above 2.4 in log scale, they kind of um, uh, typically uh, ended up uh, with a higher uh, steady state level, whereas those who were at the, at the, at the lower level, they, they, their 2011 assets reflect also a relatively lower level. So therefore, uh, this is a blown up version of that diagram. This is uh, the kind of uh, the transition equation is S-shaped. This is uh, one of our key things that we, I wanted to show you. And, and the fact that uh, K hat is estimated to be something like 2.34. This is the transition equation in the control villages, okay? And here, of course, you have to notice the difference in the scales because they were, you know, this is a discre discreetly lumpy asset transfer that the treatment guys received, okay? And here, uh, it is more of a single crossing vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, you know, transition equation and the 45 degree line. So for the control group, is it also looking at the ultra poor or is it the entire sample of the control group? No, the control, you know, 6,000 people, these are the ultra poor, 3,000 of these are treatment and 3,000 of them are controlled. Yeah, it's not looking at the whole village. 
So, so yeah. Uh, Matrish, a quick question on the treatment. Uh, since you, you since you've been saying that there's heterogeneity, uh, how much of it, how much these results being driven by outliers? Because e even in previous ultra poor studies, it seems it's not at all uniform. Could this just be driven by a few outliers who receive a transplant? No, we, we, we have done various kinds of robustness checks and, and, and certainly they have passed some threshold of scrutiny. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, I, you know, I mean... So, so, so you mean to say you've done those precise Fisher tests that is possible, young type of work? On, uh, I would, I'm not the econometrician in this uh, group, uh, so I, I, see, would, I, I would have to check that and therefore, but uh, yeah, I would say, uh, you know, um, we have, uh, there are lots of referee comments we're dealing with and this is not a concern. So, yeah, no, sure. yeah, so one, one, another quick question. Because is is it a clarifying question though? Because I, I don't want to get bogged down at, at kind of midpoint of the main bazaar, but if it's a clarifying question, okay, please I can ask. Wait, I can, but if I can, all, I, the, all the, you know, again, countable infinite number of things we could have done, and at least some fraction we have done, I would prefer to come back uh, to that at the end of the talk. But for now, okay, if fine. something is not clear, do feel free to stop and ask, okay? Sure. No worries. Okay, so um, this is the transition equation. This is the, that for the control villages and what does the difference in assets correspond to? We can see that as you have the higher and higher assets, you're getting into more and more of the specific uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, higher valuation assets, et cetera. And that uh, clearly is helping, okay? So I think this is a repetition. This is the parametric estimation that gives you. So I want to now come to the core identification question. And that's why I'm speeding up. Otherwise, I don't mean to uh, shut off discussion. And that's what I'll kind of really, uh, these are the things I'll focus on and I'll stop. And then uh, for the rest of the time, we can just discuss whatever we want to do, discuss. So one, there are several types of, you know, clearly we cannot use the, treatment and control in the way ideally we could have used if like a lottery or if like this twin studies or whatever, if there's a way in which we could have randomized uh, this uh, by initial capital ownership, right? Then uh, exact, you know, or narrow band wealth class, then we would not have to worry so much and we could have done, done more a control and treatment type of comparison. Here we don't have advantage, uh, we, we don't have um, uh, that, that um, uh, option uh, to nail the question. So what we do is we do uh, several sets of things. The first thing we say is, hey, maybe it's like, okay, you have a good fortune, you, you win something, you know, a lumpy thing, but in the end, it really doesn't change things very fundamentally. So in particular, we can uh, say that, uh, is it the case that what we see for the treatment folks is similar to what we see for the control folks? In other words, they receive certain shocks, whether at the village level, whether uh, specific to this particular uh, ultra poor group in rural Bangladesh, in Northern rural Bangladesh, et cetera. So we kind of want to see that whether uh, it is a kind of effect that uh, is really picking up uh, that, that kind of uh, uh, you know, pattern of shocks and not really causally due to this uh, asset shock, okay? So that's one of the uh, one of the things that we first check, right? That um, essentially uh, we kind of do that. Uh, uh, we kind of define a placebo threshold indicator, which is equal to one, if and only if the household would have been above the threshold had they received the transfer of the same value as the treatment household. So we kind of create this kind of a placebo thing, right? And then we see that you know, there, if, you, if you look at what is going on with the treatment group and the control group, okay, uh, clearly there is no jump in the control group, right? Even when we have kind of created this as if uh, they received the shock. So there's nothing that is going on. I'll skip the details, but roughly speaking, what we do is this, that is there something that was ha happening around uh, people who were essentially in the lower peak right, uh, in, in the bimodal distribution, because if something was happening, say, I don't know, export opportunities and remittance incomes went up from the migrant workers working in the cities, whatever it is, for that particular wealth class, and that is what the treatment guys were picking up, 
that's clearly is not the case. There's something that is happening around that threshold. Okay, that's what this regression is capturing. So what I want to uh, uh, come and now at a at a more uh, uh, sort of you know a different um, um, and perhaps the core thing that I want to focus in the remaining time is the issue that has bothered us from the very beginning that what if k0 was picking up something else okay and therefore you know maybe it is individual ability productivity whatever it is yeah so what and there's also the thing to keep in mind that this program was just not just an asset transfer program this also had a, a you know a training part of it and therefore, uh, you would also worry how, 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 and you know, at a, at a basic level, we cannot separate out the training uh, role of the training versus the role of the uh, uh, asset transfer itself because they were bundled. But you could also have to worry about uh, the shifting of this productivity parameters and how it is, um, you know, affecting based on where you were, etc. So the thing that we try to do. Let me first explain the kind of thinking behind it and then show you a bit of the nitty gritty of it. What we try to do is let's figure out some sources of heterogeneity among these guys other than uh, the capital, initial capital. So one thing we figured out was A, because there is an underlying productivity parameter. So suppose we look at individuals who are in more productive villages, which would presumably be driven by access to the market, certain infrastructure, etc., because we can tease out the village fixed effects. Okay, as much as we can also tease out the individual fixed effects, and in some of the exercises we use that. But here I want to show you uh, this one. So then basically we would like to show that, hey, you know, uh, in certain of the higher productivity villages versus lower productivity villages, this capital threshold should be different. Whatever I was trying to show you using that diagram that implicitly took A to be the same. But suppose it's the same poverty trap story. It's just that some guys, you know, you ship that curve, that Wrigley S curve uh, by high A and low A. Uh, the underlying threshold for crossing a critical capital level for which you then jump um, uh, to a higher steady state, that would be different. And that's one of the tests we use uh, by variation of A. And the same thing we do with respect to savings, because we can estimate what is the fraction of, of their incomes they're kind of saving up, et cetera. And once again, we have the high savers and the low savers. And, um, and once again, we try to um, uh, then put in individual initial capital fixed effects. So that's a very, uh, uh, what can you say, uh, stringent standards we're imposing that even those who have uh, very similar capital levels, uh, if those who have a lower saving versus higher saving, is that displaying the kind of discontinuous behavior that we, we, we observe uh, in the uh, core framework, okay? So basically what we do to test whether individuals with higher saving face a lower threshold, we use the dependency ratio as an instrument for savings because a larger share of earnings can be saved when there are fewer household members who consume but do not earn for the obvious uh, uh, endogeneity concerns. And to test for differences due to earning potential, we use village measure of excess livestock earnings for non-beneficiaries at baseline. That is our way of teasing out uh, the fixed effects. Okay, essentially what we do is regress livestock earnings on the number of cows, linear squared, take the mean residuals at the village level. Villages where individuals earn more than predicted by the livestock holdings must have the right infrastructure for livestock businesses. Okay, so what we do here, and uh, this is one of our, um, uh, uh, one set of findings. What we have here, is uh, the transition equation, right? This is uh, again, productive assets at baseline and then productive assets at year four, yeah, which is 2011. So the red uh, curve is relates to the savings rate above the median and the um, um, black curve is the savings rate below the median, okay? And indeed, this non-parametric estimate suggests that uh, the savings rates above the medium, essentially um, what you have is a higher kind of steady state and a lower threshold that you would need to cross to reach that highest steady state. 
okay? So basically, uh, the transition equation for households above the median is vertically above that for households below the median. And these different thresholds provide an alternative identification strategy, which is we take the same K0 and the variation in S we exploit is within the treatment group as S may be correlated with K0, we use the dependency ratio as an instrument for S, okay? And they do things, uh, the same thing with the earnings potential. The fact that, uh, let me just, you know, this is the what we do with the A's. It's the same kind of exercise, except for we are using the fixed effects at the village level and predicted earnings above the median versus predicted earnings below the median. These are the two sets of transition equations we estimate. And once again, the ones above the median have uh, are vertically above this. So we estimate three regressions for each of these two dimensions. So basically what, I, what we do is essentially that's the baseline, which is similar to what I presented earlier, okay, where I was not uh, making a distinction between high savers, low savers, or high uh, productivity villages, low productivity villages. Let's look at the right panel just so that I don't want to duplicate or uh, whatever I'm saving in, uh, saying in both cases. So in the first thing, what I'm doing is in the baseline, if you have above K hat versus, you know, uh, not, and you, we don't have any uh, fixed effects here, and we kind of get a significant uh, effect of uh, being above K hat. But then comes a kind of rigorous test where basically we put in uh, a baseline uh, log uh, K zero fixed effect. So essentially, we are just estimating uh, those uh, with similar capital levels, but those with higher saving propensity or uh, observed saving behavior versus low. And once again, we identify uh, the, the, the kind of threshold effect in terms of uh, whether this capital stock uh, injection puts you above the threshold or not. And then we do a placebo test, which I, you know, I'm happy to explain in detail, but roughly speaking, what it does is it takes the, it takes the higher threshold that will be for the lower uh, savers that they would need to cross, and then does the thought experiment that if they were given the corresponding capital level of the lower, uh, sorry, high, you know, uh, okay, I'm, 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 uh, this tends to happen and uh, I, I will not blame the listeners if uh, they're getting tangled up because I'm getting tangled up here. But let me uh, do a retake. What the placebo is basically trying to say is, hey, you have two levels of two different thresholds, the K at L and K hat H. K hat H is, is the one uh, for the, you know, that's the higher threshold and K hat L is for the high savers. That's the lower threshold, right? Essentially, what you want to show is, is that the case that only those whose capital stock, initial capital stock plus the injection they receive or the transfer they receive, they get them above their relevant capital threshold. The K hat H is when you have the um, behavior of the transition equation, namely uh, your uh, save, uh, capital accumulation or capital level in 2011 is, is is kind of at the high level because you cross the threshold and that is also kind of playing up, okay? So it is to say that if you were a basically low saving person, therefore your threshold would be higher to cross, then the same amount of capital injection is not gonna help you. So you actually need more for those guys, okay? So that's the story and we do the same things for the earnings potential. And once again, uh, I, I, you know, I, I have the details here and I'm happy to come back to it because I do realize I'm uh, now uh, using up, uh, up the time. So let me step back a bit and summarize what we tried to do here because I do realize I went a little uh, fast through uh, this, this section. So first what we did was uh, we asked the question that uh, is it the case that in the control villages compared to the treatment villages, were there patterns of shocks that we see this 
threshold effect in the capital accumulation regression we are estimating because that in the end is really be I know one simple way to look at all these uh, regressions is we're kind of estimating the uh, transition equation or, or the capital accumulation equation regressing capital in 2011 uh, in, in terms of uh, the post transfer capital in 2007 okay so the first thing we did was do we find a threshold effect you know what is that threshold effect and do we find it for the control groups too because something else could be happening uh, 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 for that wealth class of uh, folks and that is not the case. Then we asked the question that even though we find a very strong threshold in our early uh, result that we show of the um, uh, estimation of the uh, non-parametric estimation of the transition equation, but now we are allowing for the heterogeneity in terms of high savers and low savers as well as high productivity villages versus low productivity villages. And then we carry out a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, regressions, which are of course asking of the following nature, that just think of two individuals, low saver guy and high saver guy. The high saver person's transition equation will be a vertical shift of the transition equation compared to the low saving person's uh, transition equation. What that would mean is that the uh, high saving person's steady state will be at a higher level. And basically for the same uh, capital injection level, the high saver person is more likely to have crossed the threshold than the low saving person, okay? So that's the heterogeneity we are kind of exploiting. And using that, we are able to compare or control for the fact that even people who had very similar cap initial capital stocks, but the high saver ones, they are showing that particular threshold effect at um, the estimated level of K hat, but the low saving people are not showing it. So it's a bit like what, what you're saying here is that suppose initially both of you had the same capital stock, but one of you was more dynamic, more forward looking. Now you've given an extra bit of asset. What you would then expect is essentially, even though your initial K zero was the same, the person who was higher saving would do more with this and in a discontinuous way. If it was a continuous way, then that wouldn't be so interesting. Anyway, there's a number of things we do for the rest of the paper, as I already uh, uh, said, uh, this is kind of a long number of uh, exercises we carry out, including some structural estimation of misallocation labor, et cetera, and policy discussions. But I have presented you the kind of core results in terms of what does this data set uh, tell us in terms of the core question of poverty traps. Are there alternative explanations to what we find? Are there other tests that we could carry out? And I would just stop here and then open the floor or let the chairs kind of now, um, uh, you know, carry on the discussions in the spirit of a more general uh, Q&A. Thank you, Mantishta. Uh, so the so we can ask questions. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, so, Matresh, uh, can you hear me, Matresh? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, hi, Mudesh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hi, Matresh. Uh, Matresh, my question: uh, since you have said you are not uh, the econometrician. What bothers me essentially is that if you're finding heterogeneous effects, mm -hmm. then uh, you know these traditional T statistics which you are reporting for significance are not actually valid because the reason is that the returns to the assets are highly skewed, which means that these standard measures are not really uh, a very valid way to test whether the average effects are there. So, so, so that is one challenge. So, I'm, I'm, I'll probably no, read I your paper. Uh, Mudit, uh, yeah. uh, just to cut, cut through a little bit. You know, yeah. you, you are familiar with my work, so I was not being unduly modest or whatever. No, no I'm not a specialized econometrician, but I have enough publications of you know empirical papers. So, um, uh, I would just say that we did carry out a number of tests. And as I said, it has now crossed a certain level of scrutiny from very specialized econometrics you know, applied econometrician referees. So I do not have a specific answer to how I we see. did it, but I would be, you know, deeply surprised if that is what is explaining our results, because we are going through a very rigorous, you know, revise and resubmit process. And this no, is I, uh, not we are giving, said, uh, given a grip on, but I wish I had a specific answer to your question. And then I, I wouldn't have to say that. But, 
yeah. Yeah, no, no, so that's what, so, so because since you were reporting uh, on the tea, and how many villages, sorry, I missed the earlier part, how many villages were undermined? 1,300 villages. 1,300 villages were undermined. Yeah. So that These was are another... all in the QJ paper. These are, you know, these summary stats, because, you yeah. know, this paper really looks at a different set of issues, but uh, these uh, things are already in the QJ 2017 sure. Sure. paper. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. So uh, if I can ask one question, Matushta, so, you know, typically in these uh, heterogeneous kind of effects thing nowadays, you know, basically since you have lost the, in, to some extent, the advantage of the randomization, to some extent, I mean, of course, you still have some, you know, it is still a randomized control trial. Uh, the concern is that, you know, these heterogeneities that you're doing for structural estimation, I mean, the structural parameters like savings rate and so on and so forth, Mm -hmm. which should be instrumented by the dependency ratio. But, you know, family structures and so on and so forth, I mean, haven't these now been shown to itself change the family dynamics no. of income generation no, sure. behavior? No, like Obiru, I mean, yeah. no, sure. Obiru, I would just say everything is endogenous. And unless you randomize exactly at the ideal unit, nothing is foolproof. Yeah, so if, if that would be my generic answer to this. So I agree with you. I mean, I would say the spirit should more be Given the data set, what else could we have done? But but if we could go back in time, and indeed, you know, given you can see the, uh, you know, what uh, once again, I think we should benchmark results with what other studies have done, right? So clearly in this study, if we d had that additional feature, that would be a believe, believe, uh, believe me, uh, you know, we would be, you know, our struggles for the last three years over which the paper got uh, written uh, would be less. So I completely agree with you. Everything is endogenous. So dependency, it's not ideal. You would ideally want some RCT there, but it's not there. So I think, you know, I mean, you, you're welcome to be skeptical on this. That is, of course, uh, you know, up to you. But what I'm saying is that, is there a constructive strategy that you have that we could use? For example, what Mudit was saying, I take that there are specific tests. In fact, Mudit, it'll be great if you can email me because I, you know, I am, I, I'm not satisfied with my own answer because I don't know exactly how uh, this was done, but I would very much like to double check whether uh, that was done or not, right? But Obiru, on this though, I would appreciate, yes, it is, you know, it's not ideal, but what else could we have done? So, so you said that there were some structural equations that you, I was wondering whether this, this kind of question would be the right kind of question where you do structural modeling, where in some sense, you know, you, you try to match some part of your data and then leave some part you know, uh, untied and then see whether that kind of follows the empirical patterns of the data. So in the, in the spirit of calibration kind of stuff. We, we did that. I, you know, I have to say that, you know, where there is a, if you look at the paper that I shared, the CEPR working paper version, and now of course we are uh, re revising it for a journal. So that, that, that is, uh, things have changed a bit, but there is, I would say roughly one third of the paper is doing exactly that. So we are exactly aware of that issue. And we do take some of the misallocation, you know, uh, heterogeneity at the individual level, and we, we do that. But once again, I would say that maybe it is my uh, kind of more a theorist uh, way of looking at data. I think that if you're not persuaded by that first diagram that something is going on here, then I don't think anything else will really fundamentally persuade you because structural estimation is what structural estimation is, right? I mean, in the end, these are hypothetical, you know, simulations you're carrying out with different scenarios and they're good diagnostics for certain things. But I would still say uh, having that threshold effect is what really got us going into this. And we haven't been able to kill that threshold effect. And that to me, for me, is the most persuasive aspect of that there is something going on here. Professor uh, Ghatak? Yeah. Yeah, I have a query here. So uh, thank you very much. I mean, uh, what I see that you are trying to identify based on uh, asset transition and the threshold effect, but uh, the theoretically, particularly the, the solo type of setup, the way you try to uh, convince that basically it is coming from uh, non-convexity of the production function, right. at least the asset curve. And also from your one of your earlier paper, if I remember, it also comes from non-homotheticity non of your preference as well. So is there any way using your data you can first test whether there exists any non-convexity in production function and any kind of non-homotheticity? And no, then we, you, 
you no, I think no, I don't know. I mean, no, you're exactly right. And yeah, thanks for uh, uh, referring to the earlier paper I have, which kind of classifies poverty trap models into those that are driven by what I call external frictions, which is a combination of non-convexity together with market frictions, because otherwise if it's just a production non-convexity, you can just borrow and overcome it. So you typically need some kind of a market friction, which could also be insurance one, and the non-convexity in the production or earnings uh, um, uh, kind of uh, technology, right, to put the, have that. But here we do uh, focus on that. If you look at, you know, if you look at the core stylized point, the way the shift is happening, right? I mean, a cow is a cow, right? I mean, you can't get a mini cow. You cannot get like a micro cow, right? Uh, you know, okay, that was a slightly jokey answer, but on a more serious note, if you, it, let's think through this. Suppose it was land in Sorry? Could buy a goat or a chicken, right? Exactly, exactly. So, so, so your answer is voice is coming a bit distorted. I heard what you're saying, but yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so, but let me give you a more abstract answer and then follow up on Som's intervention. So, yes, I would say that the thing this, uh, you know, again, those who have uh, worked on this area would know. See, if you have rental markets for every asset that worked frictionlessly, then in some ways, you know, you could overcome poverty traps again. Suppose you need one acre of land because literally you cannot produce on a one square inch of land. Whereas our standard production functions, you know, Inada actually says that when you're working on a square inch of land, that's actually when your productivity is very high, right? And as you have more and more. But going back to what I was just saying that you cannot have a mini cow, you could have a rental service. You could, somebody could buy a cow and then you could rent it by an hour, right? Says I will milk it, you know, by this hour and whatever. Similarly in land, I could buy a coffee shop, uh, whatever space in, in central city and then, you know, share that. So pr presumably there is some market friction you would need in that indivisibility. But Som has ra raised a very good question. And indeed, if you look at some of the descriptive uh, stats that I showed earlier, so let me actually go back to this because that might be a more direct answer to his question that, yeah, you have a number of things these people are using. So uh, uh, folks, can you, can you see? Yeah. Okay, just let me show this. So this kind of is to some degree, uh, if you have, uh, you know, this is where the more total productive assets you have, you are shifting away, you're not having lots of poultry, right? You're moving away uh, first to tools, then to cows, then, you know, sorry, then to goats, poultry, goats, then tools, vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So that is one uh, simple thing that you can see that your asset composition is changing. And then your hourly, depending on whether you have uh, the kind of various occupations, the more assets you have, you are changing the value composition of the assets too, number one. And number two, these facts are showing that your earnings in terms of hours per day or hourly earnings, that is also going up. So clearly there is uh, evidence of um, uh, non-convexity here because you cannot replicate with, uh, I don't know, 10 chickens or maybe 20, what you can do with one cow, okay? And again, there's something else that uh, comes up. I'll, let me show you, and sorry to strain your eyes uh, through the rapid turnaround. Uh, this one, yeah. So if you look at what this, uh, these are the different types of assets here, right? And uh, essentially what you, what you have is the more and more assets you have, it's just a different visual uh, picture, uh, uh, a visual depiction of this, that's, that's what is going on. So going back to it, we do test for a number of things in terms of income effects on saving rates, et cetera, and we do not find significant effects. As I said, that this is an 80 page long paper and I only presented about one third of it and, uh, you know, and, and, and partly maybe driven by my own focus on this uh, in terms of the issues. But yeah, I think that absolutely you could test for income uh, effect driven poverty traps and you know, uh, friction driven poverty traps. So yes, there is prima facie uh, indication of indivisibilities or non-convexities in the production technologies or more broadly the earnings technology. Thank you. Hello, Professor. 
Sorry, I can't hear you. Can you speak louder? Hello, Professor. Hello. Sorry, I, I can't uh, hear you. I, I oh, think that, different. yeah, so yeah, I can't, but I think he asked a question in the chat. Uh, this is Vijay Prakash. He's asked for ultra poor, maybe asset transfer improved food consumption. I guess the question yeah. is whether it increased consumption of food. Uh, this is a very good question. So there's a whole set of slides that I would normally uh, present in a, in a you know, full length uh, seminar, one and a half hours, where we actually do this. So basically what we do is uh, the following. So I'm sorry again, I, I, I hate it when um, you know, slides flow so fast and now I'm inflicting this on you. So my, my apologies for that, but I'm just trying to locate it. So yes, what we did was, could it be the Dasgupta Rai or Blissenstern kind of nutrition, actually Leibenstein going back to uh, some of the uh, pioneers in the 50s and uh, 40s and 50s, uh, many of our important development ideas uh, really come from there. Is it an efficiency wage type effect? So here we kind of basically try to see that, hey, let's take this threshold that we have non-parametrically estimated about you know, log capital value of 2.36 or something, and then try to see what is happening to annual food expenditure, caloric intake per day per capita, et cetera, and we don't see a jump. So that one question that we had, uh, we had, uh, uh, you know, had some um, uh, uh, you know, um, traction on. Is there any other question? And one for body mass index too. So in the next panel, we also have BMI and et cetera. Yeah. So Mohitisha, I just want, since someone's was asking, I just thought I should just ask this question. You know, there's an ultra poor transfer that happened in Andhra also way back in, I think around 2009. Mudit will know, I think Shamika was part of that study with uh, Jonathan Modok. And uh, from what I, for what I remember that the effects of that were rather muted. Uh, you know, there were complications that NREGA had also started at yeah, the same yeah. time. Could, yeah. could it be that these transfers were in fact not large enough? I think this, they transferred some goods, if I remember correctly. And maybe Actually, that- I'm glad you asked the question because we do uh, uh, do an exercise which is a bit related to it, okay? So uh, thanks for opening, uh, you know, that. So I think it's a valid question. Uh, you know, valid or, I mean, all the questions are valid. What I mean is this is very much uh, at the heart of what we are trying to do, right? So, uh, you know, what, what do we learn from here about other programs, what should be done, etc. So here, what we do is uh, we basically look at uh, the uh, empirical distribution of the ultra poor in rural Bangladesh, control treatment together, and essentially try to see at the baseline, how short they were of this critical asset level after which, you know, something positive seems to be happening, okay? So then we see this observed distribution that, right, I mean, uh, I think the way to interpret is uh, on the horizontal axis, we have household transfer value, which is, you know, uh, the share of annual per capita consumption, right? And on the vertical axis, you have shared of household above the K hat. And you can see that basically uh, uh, BRAC basically enabled 80, um, uh, you know, the value of that was about 80% of their annual consumption, okay? Uh, uh, a share of annual per capita consumption, the BRAC's transfer itself, okay? Now, what we did here, and again, I haven't done it. Uh, one of my co-authors had done this with great care. So, uh, but I can give you a broad uh, description of what this is doing. So this basically looks at, sorry, I think there's a more detailed slide about the number of uh, specific programs, but these red lines are as if, suppose you take a bunch of other programs, okay? Translate the numbers into the local Bangladeshi currency at that time, et cetera, do the appropriate conversion, and then try to ask that, you know, you know what, what, is the, what would have been the threshold that uh, allowed them to uh, cross? And we can see that microfinance only basically allows, you know, it's about, uh, you know, 20% of what, uh, what the annual consumption expenditure is. And uh, Narega is, is a bit on the low side. 
And if you look at the uh, uh, transfer program, I think the uh, India one that we have here, that refers to the Banerjee et al. 2015 paper. So essentially what you see is that percentage of households above K hat on transfer size. So the BRAC obviously, as well as some of the other ones like Blackman et al., which where the transfers are even bigger, you know, Blackman and House of Shapiro, those are, uh, you know, as the transfers that are bigger. So yes, I think one of the general um, uh, uh, conclusion of that is um, uh, basically size matters. And this one actually was a pretty sizable transfer. And compared to, I, I don't know about the specific UNRWA study, but certainly there's the Banerjee, uh, Dree, Kalan, a number of others. And that, that study kind of falls here. Thanks. Uh, any other questions, comments? I think everyone is convinced by your presentation. And I do, I, uh, and I am sincere when I'm, uh, you know, I don't know if Modit is still logged in, but I would actually want to check uh, the standard error issues that he uh, mentioned and make sure that we do that. Um, so yeah, but um, otherwise uh, feel free to, um, you know, ask me questions um, by email or... Uh... So, um... I guess then we can conclude the talk. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for this talk, and uh, we'll uh, we'll hope to see you physically when all this ends. Uh, I had a so I had a request to everyone else. So, uh, you have some time, right, to talk? In, uh, or are you yeah, yeah, to... that's absolutely. Yeah, I, I had budgeted some time as you had requested, and I'm yeah. happy to see uh, friend uh, faces of friends like you know Tridi Ben Ogrup and Som and others and Mudit. So yeah. I'm very happy yeah. to. So I I'd, I'd request all uh, everyone else to kind of log off. The seminar is over, uh, and then perhaps at some point when you know I think we missed the initial interaction with the department so we can have that and then maybe you know we have a student who wants to talk to you and we can schedule that uh, you know on a one-on-one -on -one thing but we can just continue so uh, i'd request everyone uh, you know apart from the group at epu to uh, the faculty at epu to now log off uh, thank you